Hello everyone, my name is Corazar, and welcome back to the Vintage Story Guide. We are back in the world hot on the heels after the last episode, having just put together our little farmstead here, and I am still tickled with how this came out. I'm so glad we found these sandstone bricks. They're really nice to work with in the early game, and very lucky too. In today's episode, while we are waiting for our crops to grow, we're going to go on a bit of an adventure. But before we do, there is one thing that we want to do for our crops here, and that is our current crop fields grow three of the five different kinds of nutrition we're going to need. We have fruit from the berry bushes, we have grain from the grain, and we have vegetables from the vegetables. Funny how that works out, isn't it? What we don't have is protein, and while there are some plants that can produce protein, namely soybeans, we don't have them, and they wouldn't grow real well here anyway. So what we're going to do is we're going to dig a trench here. The reason being is that rabbits are attracted to growing crops of most kinds, and raccoons are attracted to ripe berry bushes. And both rabbits and raccoons are sources of protein, and sometimes fat, bones, and leather. And all three of those, actually all four of those, including their meat, are things we're going to need well into the late game. In fact, I don't think you ever stop needing leather and fat, at the very least. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to dig a bit of a trench here. We're going to make it two blocks wide and two blocks deep. The reason we're making it two blocks deep is that the rabbits and raccoons typically can't get out of a ravine that is two blocks deep. Now, rabbits can sometimes freak out enough that they can sort of ricochet and pinball their way out of a ravine, but it's kind of unusual, but I have seen it happen. The reason we're making this two blocks wide is that the rabbits and raccoons will also attract different kinds of meaty creatures, and those would be wolves and foxes. Now, foxes, as I mentioned in the first episode, are they are neutral. They will only attack you if you attack them first, or I think if you sort of chase them long enough, they'll get aggravated and they'll turn around and give you a, a nip or two. Wolves, however, are highly aggressive, and while wolves can easily run or even walk over one block wide gaps, they will happily hop into a two block wide pit in order to go after rabbits or raccoons. So we're going to make this two blocks wide to maybe trap some wolves, and that way they will have less of a chance to eat our faces, and we can in turn eat their faces. This will also help trap drifters that wander too close, so we can kind of turn this into a multi-purpose killing pit in the early parts of the game. I don't normally like to do these kinds of pits, but sometimes they are fun to do, and I didn't do one in the first guide series, and so I figured it would be best to showcase this at least once, you know, in the course of a year and a half. So here we are. Now if you're building a ditch like this, I do recommend putting a ladder, probably like one on each side-ish, something like that, and one block off the ground. This is because drifters can also use ladders, but if the ladder is at least one block off the ground, they can't reach it. Their arms are too short and stubby. So that's what we're going to do here. And I will see all of you on the other side of the rest of this little ditch. Okay, with that all said and done, let's get on to getting ready for our adventure. Now, we're going to talk about what we're going to go look for and what we're keeping our eyes peeled for, but we do need to make some prep work first, and that involves getting a little closer to the woods and the potential wolves in them than I generally like, because there is something in here that we need at least a few pieces of, and I see it right over there. Do I spy any wolves? Do I hear any wolves? Woo, I heard that. Okay, you guys are fine. Right here we have what's called horsetail. Now, horsetail is a vital resource early in the game, and you can mine it just by hand or with a knife. It doesn't grow back, but you can grow it on fallow fields. If you're not growing anything in a tilled area of soil, then it will slowly generate grass, and even more slowly, generate horsetail. And horsetail is used for making healing poultices that don't heal you a whole lot, but you know what? It will really save your bacon in the long run. So we're going to get meh, some of this, maybe not a full stack, but I'll tear apart the ground here for as much as it happens to have. And then we'll take this back and we'll make some healing items with it. That is the first thing we're going to take with us on our journey here. Okay, folks, we are back home safe, and in here we have some cattails. 
and we're going to mix these up with the horsetail, and we're going to make four poultices at a time. These are horsetail from reeds. These will heal you two hit points per use, and they stack up to 16. Each set of these will use four cattails and two horsetail, so you do need a lot of cattails for them. So with that sorted, let's get into the other things that we want to bring with us on our little journey here. First of all, we need a plan. I am thinking, in the last episode, I had a chance to go up to this ridge here to look for some more crops and things while I was waiting for our clay stuff down here to finish baking. And I was thinking maybe we could go this way because this looks pretty clear and open, which means there shouldn't be too, too many wild critters with sharp teeth waiting for us there. And maybe if we're lucky, we can kind of swing around here, do a bit of a loop, and then come back down over here. And we'll see how that goes. That, that plan might just not happen. Or we could also go up north this way and see what this is. This looks like either slate or basalt and a little bit of a granite here on the edge. And the reason we're exploring is that there are a bunch of resources that we're going to be looking for. Some of which we're going to need sooner and some of which we're going to need a lot later. Like a lot, a lot later. But it's good to sort of start cataloging these early in the game so that you don't have to go looking for them in the later parts of the game where you have more things to keep an eye on. So, what kinds of things should we bring with us on our journey? Well, first of all, we're going to make sure we have enough tools and weapons, and we have four flint spears in pretty good condition. That should be good enough for now. Four spears should be able to deal with one wolf, assuming we hit all four hits, and three spears is enough for any of the surface drifters. We will bring along our usual tools. I'll probably make a new axe and pitch this one. We're going to make a fresh pot of whatever food we can, probably in the morning, because I don't think we have a whole lot. Yeah, we're a little shy on food right now, so we could make we could make two servings of porridge, or we could try to see if we can wrangle us a ram or something, or some meat. In addition, we're going to bring a small stack of torches, just enough to make a marker if we need to, or otherwise to light fires and keep ourselves, you know, being able to see. A stack of dirt, a few ladders, some sticks, and some flint. And of course, our new poultices that we just made. And that should be pretty good for our usual stuff. Now, because we have the carry-on mod, we're also going to bring along one of these. I'm going to back up so we're not aiming at anything, and there we go, it should be on our back. And there it is. So now we'll have some extra storage space to bring with us that does require a bit of interaction in order to access. Now, we are very squishy. We have, ooh, we're up to 19.4 hit points. That's actually not too shabby for this early in the game. But we don't have any armor and we don't have any shield. And I think that we're going to want both of those as much as we can get for our adventure. And believe me, what we can get isn't a whole lot. We're going to go and build some armor first. We need some wood. We can break this down into firewood. There goes that axe. But to make the most rudimentary armor, you're going to need 14 pieces of firewood, 9 pieces of dry grass, and a bit of durability off of a knife. And you will build your armor like this. And you get improvised body armor made of wood. It has no great amount of armor, but it can save your bacon in a pinch. It really, really can. Now your armor is going to go into your chest armor slot here, which is this one here. Do note that you also have a head and a pants slot. And it's not that your armor is averaged amongst your slots. Your body has a different percent chance of being hit in different areas. Your torso has the greatest chance at 50%. So half of the time, this armor will take some of the damage for us. The other half of the time, we'll get hit in the head at 20%, or the legs at 30%, and this armor does nothing for us. But on the off chance that we do need it, this can absolutely save us. So that is our armor, as wimpy as it is. What about a shield? Well, the shield is actually a bit more serviceable than the armor, and I'm going to fumble my way through making the shield. I think it's like this? No. It's the other way around. There we go. We have a crude shield. I call it a wicker shield because it looks like wicker, and it basically is. It's sticks and reeds, so yeah. Now shields go in your offhand over here, 
And that does mean that you have to kind of juggle what you're doing with your offhand if you're going to be doing a light and a shield and weapons, depending on where you're going. You may have to juggle your light, drop it on the ground, and do your fighting with this. And you don't have a light in your hand, so it can get a little, a little crazy sometimes. Now, shields, as you can see, have two stats. They have active use and passive use, and each one has a block chance and absorption rating. So passive use is if we're just running around, jumping around, and doing things, and not really paying attention, then any attacks coming from basically in front of us will have a 15% chance of being reduced by 1.5 hit points. That's a really small block chance. However, if you crouch, you'll see that you bring up your shield closer to your face, and you'll cover up basically like a third of the screen with it. It's wonderful. This will give you a 90% chance of blocking incoming attacks, and it will prevent up to 3 damage, or reduce damage, by 3. When fighting wolves that deal like 8 damage a hit, this is a lifesaver. I cannot count how many times I have used a shield and just tanked a wolf like this using a couple spears to fend them off. It works like a charm. Now also note that there is a mechanic in the game of damage tiers. Now you'll see that the improvised body armor, the bottom stat, is protection tier 0. That means it is the absolute lowest tier protection you can get. Any damage from a source of a higher tier will punch through our protection there, which is 55%, and it will also deal more damage to the armor. So while this armor has 75 hit points, basically two or three bites from a wolf will tear it to shreds, even though the wolves only deal eight damage apiece. Anyway, I think we're about ready. I'm gonna go ahead and we're going to empty our inventory mostly. I'm going to bring along, nah, we'll leave this here. We'll leave our cooking materials here because we will make a full pot before we go. And in the morning, we're going to go and victimize a sheep of some sort or another. And then we'll cook them up and have a bite to eat. And then we'll be off. I'll see you all on the hunt. All right, everyone, I have polished off the last of our forage, and we are on the hunt. I spy some sheepy sheeps over here. The way that the sheep spawn, they are sort of connected to each other. So if you see sheep wandering together, they are likely to defend each other. These females could be bound to either one or both of these males here. But this guy over here all alone? Yep, he's fair game. In fact, I think this is the one that was in our pit a couple days ago and he escaped. So what we're going to do here is we're going to just pillar up a little bit. And we're going to chuck some spears at him. He's going to run. Let's see how far he runs. We're going to... Oh wow, we have no range on this, do we? I forgot, we are a clockmaker. We have very poor range on thrown spears. Now, he might decide to come and gore us at some point after a couple hits. So I might actually put my shield back in our slot here and keep an eye on which one he is. They're trying to play a game of cups here. I'm pretty sure it's you. Oh, we're out of spears. Got him. Okay, wow. As you can see, these guys hurt. Even with a shield, reducing our damage by three each time. Of course, I think our shield may have let one of those attacks through entirely. But yeah, we are down to about half health. So hunting can be dangerous business. We're going to go ahead and we're going to harvest this guy up, and we'll see what we get. Not too bad. Ten meat, one large rawhide, and two lumps of fat. And then once we break his corpse up, we will get the bones. There we go. Got a couple of those. Let's go back. We're going to cook these up, and we're going to get heading out. All right, everyone, with about half the day already burned behind us, we're going to head out. And I did notice that the ram actually already almost completely destroyed our body armor. As you can see, it did a total of like eight damage to us, but almost 80 damage to our armor. So I've made another set here, and I've also healed up, and let's get going. Along the way, let's talk about what kinds of things we're on the lookout for, and what kinds of resources we want to get a handle on as early as possible. Certainly there are tons of early game resources that you want to keep an eye out for at all times. Things like sticks and flint, 
and ruins and so on. All things that are sources of great early game materials that you need lots of and never really go out of style. Maybe flint goes out of style eventually, but you will always need sticks. The first big resource you're going to find kind of dotted across the landscape are, of course, ruins. And ruins are an excellent resource for a number of different things. You can find different kinds of ore, seeds, farming resources, and even tools that can let a lucky player leapfrog over some of the early game struggle. And ruins, especially now in 1.18, are also an excellent source of cheap building materials in a wide variety of colors. They used to only come in granite and occasionally sandstone, but now they come in basically whatever color of rock is on the surface. And hey, look at that, there's a ruin right up here. Cool. So this is made of chert cobblestone, as you can see. It is a nice red color and would probably go really nicely with our sandstone, I think. Now under here, of course, we will find some kind of treasure. Let's get our shovel out and we're gonna dig this up. And in the last episode, I know we touched on the bony soil and we're gonna look for some of that, but also right here, ooh, we have a tool vessel. Now we gotta be careful with these. <laughs> in the first guide series game, the very first vessel I broke, I think maybe the second or third, had a bunch of really advanced tools in it for the age that we were in, and I didn't want to use them because they would sort of leapfrog us over the tech era that we were in. Let's go ahead and we're going to break this and see what we get. We got... Ooh, okay, not too bad. Two flint knives and a fresh flint shovel, which we're going to need because we're going to break this one in a second. Ooh, that was a hitch and a half. And somewhere under here, we're going to find some bony soil. That's one of the things that I want to get and bring back, because we're going to use that later for finding additional treasure that we didn't already find on the road. Pretty cool. It's like a double up. You sort of double your money. That was pretty cool. And we may come back later and ransack this for its materials, but there are also other ways, and honestly easier ways, of getting cobblestone even in the early game. Now right here, and I know I mentioned that I came up here before, I found this lead last time I was up here, and we're not going to do anything with it yet, because we can't at this point, but I've marked it on the map because we're going to come back and we're going to mine so much lead it will drive you crazy. But let's get back on the road and talk about some more things that we're going to be looking for while we are out here adventuring. You can also explore to find other kinds of rock types. There are resources that you need in order to progress through certain stages of the game. You can't make mortar without lime, and to get lime, you need to have an area with limestone or chalk, or a commodity trader and a lot of gears. Leather is much the same way, although you can substitute borax for the lime. Ooh, and right here we have some chicken of the woods. This is a an edible mushroom, and we're going to go ahead and we're going to uh, leave this here, I guess. Maybe we will... Yeah, we will drop off this soil and maybe that soil. And because we are very low on food at the moment, I am absolutely going to harvest it. And we're going to also mark this chicken of the woods is here. And of course some spelt, gotta get some of that. Okay, and we are back on the road. Let's also head back the direction that we came a little bit. So I realize we're a little bit off track in the direction I wanted to go. Pine trees and acacia trees in the south can also spawn with leaking resin logs. Resin is absolutely a gating material required for many applications involving the game's mechanical aspects. And I think that, yep, that's, <laughs> here's some resin right here. We're going to go ahead and we're going to, we'll move this vine out of the way, and we are going to then hold down right click, and you can do this either with something in your hand or an empty hand, and you will get resin. These will respawn in about eight days, and if you find more than one pine tree in the same area, it's a good idea to check them and to check multiple sides of the pine trees, because sometimes you can get like two to even four resin logs spawning on a pine tree. Whatever you do, don't cut these down. Mark them and come back in eight days to get more resin. If you cut them down, no more resin, because resin does not ever spawn on pine trees that you grow as the player. Other getting materials include things like bauxite, 
which is needed to get into the Steel Age. We don't really need that now, but we will want to look for it eventually. And since we just hit that pine tree, it's also good to get a feel for where to find different kinds of wood, because different wood types have different colors and aesthetic qualities. This is mostly for decoration, but there are also some wood types that are technically gaining materials, namely oak and acacia, but these are common enough they're not really an issue. There are also nine different kinds of traders. We've only met one so far, and since they are randomly determined, it's pretty common to struggle to fill in the eighth or ninth trader type that you just can't seem to find. Lastly, the big, big one, the big gating material that I'm concerned with in the early game is beeswax. Beeswax is needed for candles, and you can also use it for a couple other odds and ends, including sealing crocs. Ooh, and look here, we've got some copper ore. All right, we're going to mark this. When we are ready to enter the copper age, we're going to be very well situated for success. I don't much like this sort of hilly terrain plus brush, but I think we'll make do. And it does look like this is... I think this is slate. Yeah, we've got slate. Slate's real nice for things like roofing, and there are certain materials you can only find embedded within slate areas. They're kind of rare, but they're there. Wow. Look at those crazy mountains over there. Is that nuts or what? We are not likely to climb those anytime soon, but man, those are wild to look at. Oh, and hey, more copper. And lots of it. Now, since it is getting on toward nightfall, I'm going to start looking for some grass to shave down. And we're just going to make a spare bed. And we're going to sleep out here. Probably not quite under the stars. It is a high rift activity day. And so we'll make a little hut. We'll hunker down in it for the night. And then, assuming the drifters are not swimming in the morning, we will head out. Otherwise, we'll have to make sort of a run for it. Let's go over this away. I don't want to go into those mountains over there that we saw. They're really cool, but they would be crazy to try to tackle uh, basically ever. <laughs> Here we go. What are you? Ooh, your quartz. Okay, cool. So I want to go ahead and mark this. Quartz is actually very, very common, but it's somewhat less common as a surface ore. And, oh, hello. We'll get to you in a second. And quartz is used for making glass of all kinds. And in the early game, you can't mine quartz until you are beyond the Copper Age. You have to be able to make bronze tools in order to mine quartz. But if you pick up these bits off the surface, you can basically get some free quartz. Here we go. Here's what quartz in chert looks like. It requires a tool tier three of bronze to break. So yeah, we cannot do anything with this quartz until we have bronze. You can also find, very rarely, silver or gold mixed in with the quartz here. And if there's silver or gold in the vein here, you can find those bits on the surface sometimes. Those are very rare, however, and I wouldn't really count on finding a ton of those. But I'm going to get down here somewhere, and then we'll build a little tiny hut, and then we'll hunker down for the night. Here we go. Here's a nice little tiny place. I can still hear a rift just over across the way. We're going to make a really tiny house. And that should do. It's going to build a little bed here, and we're going to talk about the map for a second while we are waiting for night to fall. So, remember I said we need limestone? Well, this is it. We have found limestone. That is, that is very lucky. This place reminds me actually of my very, very first survival world in Vintage Story. I never showed it on the channel. I played it alone for eh, 500 hours or so. And I actually spawned in a giant limestone area that bordered on chert and actually chalk. Sandstone was a ways away. I didn't have any nearby. But I had plenty of other interesting stone, including the green one and some granite. Fun fact, if you spawn in a limestone area, you may struggle to find copper in the early game. This is because copper does not spawn in limestone as a native ore, and this includes the surface ores that I noted were spawned separately from the deep ores. Instead, you might find malachite, which is a green copper ore, but it doesn't get spawned as a surface ore. It is spawned only as a deep ore, but 
it does spawn close to the surface. So I was in an area where there was no malachite and no copper anywhere, and I struggled for the longest time. I'm going to go ahead and pass the night, hopefully get to a calmer morning, temporally speaking. Let's turn south here. I don't really want to go into this woodsy area here and get killed by wolves. Let's kind of stick to the water. We're going to come down here, and then we'll try to loop back around this way and see if we can make it home from here. I'll see all of you in the morning, I hope. Okay, everyone, it is morning, and I know I said I wanted to run back home or circle around, but I want to take a quick spin of this little limestone beach area just to see if there's any malachite on the surface. Ooh. Ooh, we don't like that too much. Wow. <gasps> what is that? Do you guys see that there? We're, hmm. You know what? It's dangerous, but I think we need to take a look at this. Because there is... I don't freaking believe it. Guys, we have found our first translocator. And it is our third episode. I absolutely do not believe it at all. This is what I was talking about earlier, where if you repair these, you can then stand on them to teleport you to distant locations. And they're, these are everywhere. These are pretty much everywhere in the world. They're just often hard to find. But uh, I guess not today. And they also have a lot of treasure in their different places here. Oops. There's a, apparently granite stones inside that. And yeah, there's just so much good stuff to find here. Let's... Ooh, we need to mark this. What I will do is I think I will use this dirt to basically block this off just so that we don't fall down here and die because otherwise I absolutely will do that. So let's see, we have three closed aged crates. We have a small pile of junk metal that spawned some metal scraps. Those are interesting. We can get to those in a bit. And what else do we have in here? Ooh. Oh, how did you spawn up there, buddy? Oh, come on. Ow, is there more of you? I'm gonna hit myself. Apparently this guy spawned up here. Or something. That's kind of mean. Have a torch. We have a large pile of junk metal over here. Do you have force? Oh, you have metal parts. Perfect. Most translocators will spawn with metal parts nearby. Not all of them, but most of them. And you can start repairing them with the metal parts. And you see it kind of puts the glass back down, gets some of the metal gears back in place. But it's not operational yet. We need three temporal gears, or in our case, because we're a tinker, or sorry, a clockmaker, we only need two temporal gears to repair this thing. So that green gear we used earlier to set our spawn, we need two of those, and we can repair this and go on long journeys. All right, what else is in here? We have some rusty gears. These are the currency of the world. We're going to steal these. We have a tuning cylinder, some flint, don't mind if I do, and some sphalerite, which is zinc. That's all in all not too shabby. Let's take all of it, take our torches, and we're going to start heading home in that roundabout manner I told you about to try to sort of maximize our visibility of everything in the world here. Let's go ahead and take our bed. We're going to have a very, very full inventory. Hopefully using these dirt blocks to get our way out of here. That will help resolve some of that. That's a very precarious trek down. My goodness. All right, let's get moving sort of around and then back home. Yeah, we have plenty of limestone and drifters. Let's keep moving away from the drifters. And I think what we'll do is, in the future, we will come back here on a search for things like bees and more resin. But for the time being, because we are so squishy right now, and our armor is actually, our armor's actually still in pretty good shape, I think we're going to hightail at home and come back at a later time to look for those resources. Also, noting that there's a ruin here. Since our inventory is so full, I'm just going to go ahead and mark it, and we'll have to come back later and check this out too. If you are on the lookout for bees, by the way, 
you want to turn up your in-game sound and probably wear headphones, it really helps, because you can hear them from quite a ways away. Of course, bees will be harder to hear in rain, but... Oh, there you are. We're just gonna swim away from him. Let's see if we can get farther south. We'll kind of come around this tip of what this mountain range looks like to be here, and then we'll try to get home from there. I think that's gonna be the way to do it. Ooh. Assuming we can get there. I hear more friends, so we're just gonna keep moving. Here we go, we're finally back in some kind of clear area here. We get a view of the terrain around us. We have sheep, we have what looks to be flint in stone up there. Another big cave. And some more hills till we get down to this area here. It's gonna be real dicey getting around, I hope we can. And right there, I believe, I spy a wolf lurking in wait for us. So we're going to try to avoid, we're gonna avoid that by dropping down over here, I think. Kind of cutting through there. If you do find yourself beset by wolves, and maybe by bears, you can sometimes shake them if you run by rabbits or other things they like to chase. If you can sort of get them to notice the alternate prey instead of you, sometimes you can get away with your flesh still attached to your bones. We are not getting through there, are we? We have to go around this. Wow. That's a long one. But let's see what we can do. Another pear tree. Not too bad. And over here we have another ruin. I'm gonna mark this and come back later. Alright folks, we made it back. We are basically in what's kind of our own backyard at this point. There's our house in the distance. Even though you're getting close to home, you do want to keep your guard up because the wolves that exist inside the forests have a tendency to wander. They can wander well outside of their spawning area. And also, if you're not too familiar with the area, then running around blindly is a great way to find big holes with your feet, and some of them go very, very far down. But we are safe and sound at home. I'm going to go ahead and unload, and we got one turnip from that. Wow, that was amazing. And let's take stock of what we found and what we can do with our newfound goodies. And our torches just burned out. So I didn't actually cover this yet, but your torches do burn out every 48 hours. You have to replace your torches, or they turn into useless stumps. So that's why I will occasionally be seen breaking these and replacing them for seemingly no reason. A very good reason. All right, everyone, we are back, and I spent a couple minutes just putting away some of the extra junk that we don't need to really worry about having. I wanted to go over the things we found and what some of this means for us. So, the big things we found here, we got some rusty gears. These are a great way to get started 
in dealing with the traders. There are some traders that will buy some things that other traders sell, and their prices are somewhat variable. So even if a specific item is typically sold for more than you can buy it for, sometimes you can find it for cheaper and then sell it for more. Now we only have the one trader, we didn't actually stop by any other traders or see them, and that's what we're going to do, not now, but I will do it in between episodes, is I'm going to spend some time reviewing our path here. And I'm going to look at all the places we didn't see with our own eyeballs, and try to identify things that might be worth checking out later. Those things would be mostly things like more traders, like one down here. Judging by how far it is from our current trader, that means there could possibly be one down here somewhere, but it's not guaranteed. But I'll be doing that off camera because it is sort of slow and boring work, and it's not something you need to see a second time. So, aside from that, we got some metal scraps. Now, these can be used for a couple things. One is they can be used for making dyes when we get into die making. You can also turn them into scrap weapon kits, which give you a randomized weapon out of them once you're done. Now, these do require a good bit of vines or cattails to make, so I'm probably not going to make one right away. But if you're desperate and you happen to have some scrap metal on hand and you happen to have some rope on hand, which, I mean, good luck. Not everyone carries cattails around all the time. But you can make a makeshift weapon out of it if you are really stuck. We got some more seeds. We got a few turnip seeds and a few spelt seeds. And I also marked the locations of some rye over here. I'm going to go and get those later because we are really low on everything but fruit right now. We have gobs and gobs of fruit and nothing else. The bony soil, I want to turn our attention to for a little bit toward the end of the episode, after we get a couple other odds and ends sorted out. But yeah, we also got some resin, and we know where there is one resin tree. Now, we are going to want to eventually find a lot more resin trees, and there might be some up in here. I think this is a pine forest, and you are likely to find resin trees in pine forests, because only pines and acacia can have resin. And lastly, we got some zinc ore chunks. We can't do anything with this right now, but in the future it might come in handy. And we also found a tuning cylinder. Now, if you are unfamiliar with the history of vinyl records, cylinders were actually the original format of such devices, and you would sort of put these on a spool, and the needle would kind of go up and down rather than out from a central area or in from the outside. And these are a change to an existing feature in Vintage Story. These used to be called Resonance Archives, and that name is now used for something completely different. But these each have a particular song on them, and if you put them into a resonator, which we do not have one of, nor know where one is yet, then they will play that song for you. Now, rusty gears can be put on the floor in piles of up to five, and I'm going to leave those there because that way they won't clog up one of our baskets, which are expensive to make. And I'm going to put a couple things away, and we're going to go and get some sand and some gravel, and we're going to turn our attention to the last bit of treasure hunting I wanted to cover today, which is panning. Okay, so we're going to come up here, and we are going to dig out just a few blocks of this gravel here. Not much, just maybe, I don't know, half a dozen or so. And then we're going to skip up here to the beach, where we'll find some sand, hopefully, and dig up a few blocks of that as well. Provided there are no wolves between here and there. And let's get these home, and take a look at what we can do with them. I just noticed that our protein farm is already working. Check it out, we got one little rabbit in here, and anybody on the other side. Uh, not yet, but surely we will find more arriving in the future. So what we're going to do here is we're going to break this stone and pick up these stones too. We don't need those anymore. And I'm going to make a pan. And that is done by taking a log and putting your knife next to it on the right, and you get a wooden pan. And then you can take your pan and your sand or gravel, and you can then sit in a one block deep puddle of water, place down your sand or gravel, and right click with your pan in hand. Now you must be in water in order to do anything, it'll warn you if you try to do it outside of water, 
Once you're in water, you can then pan through it, and you might get something good. Ooh, we got something good. We got a nugget of native copper. 20 of these will smelt into a copper ingot, which means that we are 5% of the way to getting our very first copper ingot. Not too shabby. And here we got an arrowhead, a flint arrowhead. With this and a stick, we can turn it into a single arrow. If we had a bow, we could use it to shoot the arrow. So let's pan away through the rest of this block and see what else we get. One hour later. So it looks like all we got was a single church stone, and that's fine. We are just panning sand after all. Now, when you're panning sand or gravel of a particular rock type, you will end up getting stones of that rock type every now and then. Just drop you here on the floor, just to get you out of my inventory. Let's swap and we'll do the gravel, and you'll see that the gravel and the sand generally have the same types of products you can get from them. Although we've only done one block, so we're not likely to really get that much overlap. I think what we got there was a piece of flint. I saw our basket down here shake, and since we didn't get a nugget of copper or another arrowhead, then flint is the only thing it could possibly be. Let's keep our eyes on it this time. Oh, there we go. We got some blue clay. Interesting. And there we go. We got a chunk of quartz. Not too bad. We also got another native copper nugget, which means we're now 10% of our way to our first copper ingot. That's pretty cool. Now, sand and gravel are one thing, but you can also pan through bony soil. And we have some of that in here. Now, we're also getting a bit tight on inventory space. I'm going to go ahead and try to just smush my inventories around a bit to make some room here. Because the loot tables for the bony soil and the sand and gravel are vastly different, and so we make sure we have enough room to store whatever we might get from this. Let's just do one for now, and then I'll probably do the rest of them in between episodes, and then we'll take a look at them later. So we went through one block of bony soil. We got one bone, which is, I guess, you know, makes sense to me. We got a copper arrowhead, a flint arrowhead, a nugget of native gold, and some flax fibers. And this is actually a pretty good early game way of getting your hands on more flax fibers if you need to make some rope or some twine. And I have ours here somewhere. There they are. We'll add you to the pile. Now the arrowhead and the flint arrowhead and the gold can also be acquired from the sand and the gravel, although the gold is much, much, much less likely to come from sand or gravel you are more likely to get them from bony soil because it's where people died and they have their coins and their old jewelry with them and so on. But I'd say this is a pretty good start. And now you know how to bring home what looks like junk and get treasure out of it with a wooden pan. Panning is a pretty good way to while away a couple hours here and there, mostly in-game hours. I don't recommend spending real life hours doing it, but you might want to do it. But it is a great way to get some interesting stuff. There are some jewelry you can get from the bony soil. You can get some pieces of copper armor and even copper spearheads to sort of get you a nice early game weapon that you couldn't otherwise get until you get to the Copper Age. Anyway, everyone, that is going to about do it for this episode of the Vintage Story Guide. I hope you enjoyed our little escapade around the landscape, and I can't believe we made it back in one piece, but we did. That was quite a journey, a bit longer than I like to do on the very first exploration of a world, but we made it back. I think in the next episode we're going to do a little bit of covering some of the things that I might find on the map while I'm searching through it, maybe visiting those ruins again, and collecting some of the resources and treasure that we had to leave behind the first time. We may also search the woods in our backyard for some bees, just to see if there are any there. Who knows? We might get lucky. As always, my name has been Kurazar. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.